morning, everyone. You have found us on a map. the map, the Mental Health and Addiction Podcast. I'm Kimberly Walsh, one of your hosts for the show. And joining me are my co-hosts and good friends and partners in crime, the amazing Andy Bernstein and the incomparable Chris Perry Long. How so, are you? Good morning. How's Happy everybody? Friday. Hi, hi, hi. hi. <laughs> So for those of you who are new to the podcast, um, just a little introduction. Chris Long has been in the industry for many years, dedicating herself to working with families and helping people get into treatment. Andy has been an advocate for the changing for changing the landscape of mental health and addiction, both as the producer of Crosscheck Radio with hockey legend Kevin Stevens and through his own experiences. As for me, I own and operate Brady's Landing, which is a sober home for women on the Cape. We put this podcast together for everyone because uh, all three of us are very passionate about reducing the stigma around mental health and addiction. Um, we believe that the more light we shed on these topics, the less people will shun, ostracize, and otherwise punish those who uh, still suffer from mental health, health and uh, mental illness and addiction. Excuse me. So before um, Chris introduces our guest for today's show, we'd like to check in with one another. Our morning check-in. Um, the morning check-in, Andy. How are you? What's going on? I'm good. I'm not confused anymore. I actually have a new theory on it all. I, I, I do. What's the theory? What's your theory? All right. So I'm not going to get too political, but but here's the thing. So I think we all have to accept some personal responsibility for this, for how we're going to move forward, where you don't smoke. Smoking's bad for you. They tell you not to smoke. Don't smoke. They tell you not to do drugs, bad for you. I think we need to arm, be armed with information so we can actually make our own des decisions and choices as individuals going forward. I'm not saying right this now, but so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to move into what life's going to be like going forward. That's kind of how my mindset is right now. So now this could change by the end of the afternoon. Are you saying it's good to smoke and and it's no? What I'm saying <laughs> no. What I'm saying is is that I can't tell you not to do something, right? I can mm -hmm. give you information. You could say, "Oh, I shouldn't eat horrible food because I could get sick or whatever." But I think everybody has to accept their own personal responsibility to make sure that they stay away and keep the social distancing <clears throat> and do the things needed. And when you have like um you know, pro sports teams or people or businesses, they're going to have to switch how they do business. They're going to have to make it appealing for people to, or making it stay for people to want to come back. I don't think it's, um, I think we all have to do our part, all really social uh, accountability. That's kind of how my mindset is right now. And like I said, it could change in an hour, <laughs> but we're by the time we're end up doing this, but this is how I'm trying to um, train my mind to move forward and think about things in a not being locked in, but. Okay. So if I can, so let me make sure I got this right. So you're basically saying that until you have all the information and all the facts, you're going to decide how you move forward and everyone else should kind of do the same. No, I'm saying, I'm saying, you know, we, we do public service announcements. Don't drink and drive. Don't, don't, don't drink and drive. Don't, don't do things that are, um, you know, enter at your own risk kind of thing. I think, you know, we can't depend on the government to tell us what we should and shouldn't do going forward. Read on that front for sure. So what I'm saying is if you arm yourself with the information and say, I'm going to not go there because there's a ton of people there and I'm really concerned about social distancing. So maybe that's not the right place for me to go because I'm worried about picking up the virus Thank is you. what I'm saying. So I'm saying, you know, don't rely on other people to tell you, you know, use your free will and common sense to say that might not be a good place to, for me to go. Okay. That, that's a, I get that's it now. What I'm I trying to understand. explain. That makes sense. That makes perfect sense. So, Chris, but so. I, and, and I'm saying if I'm the new, if I'm a pro football team and I say, Hey, I really want the fans to come back. Well, in order to lure them back and get them to come back, what are you doing football team to make it, so that people will feel comfortable in going back. So I think everybody has to do their part to get ourselves back on the same page. That's my take. Okay. Chris? I don't know. 
It's going to change in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be done in an hour. That, an hour, right? Yeah. Um, Practically I'm, I'm over. Good. Um, for me right now, I have a lot of my hands uh, are on my plate as far as people that I'm working with. Uh, there's a lot of, I'm going to put uh, the word diversity um, in it. Um, I am seeing a lot more like a heightened mental health aspect of it, um, you know, of fear of the unknown. Uh, these people are getting stupid money in unemployment, but the worth ethic is kind of like battling with them, if that makes any sense. So I'm just, uh, you know, it's been two days. I've had a few more people added to my plate. Um, you know, I'm trying to trying to do something outside of the box for myself as far as, um, you know, my family, uh, self-care. Um, it's Mother's Day weekend. My kids are all like, what do you want for Mother's Day? Uh, I'd like to have a big family dinner, but obviously that's not going to happen. Um, but it's also, <laughs> it's also graduation <clears throat> weekend for my youngest. So it's, it's like a milestone weekend for me. Like today, today we would have been celebrating my youngest graduation from college and instead <clears throat> we're not. So, um, I'm trying to be positive and do things to help her celebrate her special day in whatever way I can and, uh, moving forward. And I'm really looking forward to talking with Gary because he is like an encyclopedia of information. One piece I just wanted to add really quick, one comment that I read that I just wanted to throw out there is, uh, is that, so we are on track to actually, um, the, the deaths that have occurred as a result of the being quarantined, the isolation and the overdoses and the subsequent suicides are actually on track to surpass the number of deaths from coronavirus. Is it, are we aware of that? That's like a that huge, surprise me. yeah, that, I thought that was a uh, pretty stark, but anyway, go on, Chris, why don't you uh, introduce our wonderful oh, hey, no. Sure. What? No, I have a topic to throw out and then we can have Gary. Oh, I'm sorry, Andy. My bad. Go ahead. Is that okay? Absolutely. It's perfect. It tees up Gary in okay. a great way. <laughs> sorry, it's, Andy. All right. Okay. All right. So, um, so I've read this article. I used to live in San Francisco for four years and I lived there from 1995 to 1999. It's a beautiful place. It is a beautiful place, but there are some crazy things that you, <laughs> that go on out there, but, which is great. It's cool. It's what makes San Francisco, San Francisco. So one of the, one of the things that I, since I left, one of the things I'm learning and one of my, I have good friends still there and the homeless population is terrible there, like like camps out in the middle of the, you know, people are sleeping on the streets. And so, um, and it's not, it's not a good, you know, they have a, it's very expensive to live there, obviously. So we're one of the expensive in the country. So you have a lot of homeless. Anyway, um, so there's an article that I just read that kind of speaks to what we're going to talk about with Gary is... Um, for as far as harm reduction and, and, and this, this subject, but um, the San Francisco Department of Public Health um, has been giving limited quantities of alcohol, marijuana, and tobacco through private funding to addicts uh, in isolation, quarantine under the city's program, housing homeless people in hotels. And so, you know, they're in, they're, they're giving it with licensed physicians, but basically they're saying that by managing the alcohol and tobacco use, it makes it possible to increase the number of guests who stay in isolation and quarantine. So they're trying to keep people off the streets that could potentially be infected. And so um, I read one of the tweets by a, a, a guy who was a, a former homeless person addict who um, substance abuse disorder or substance use disorder. Anyway, so he tweeted, he said, I found that I found out that homeless placed in hotels in San Francisco are be, being delivered alcohol, weed and methadone. And um, because they are identified as an addict alcoholic for free, you're supposed to be offering treatment. This is enabling and is wrong on many levels. So I'm throwing it out there because I think it's a great way to kick off the discussion with Gary. Now, Chris, introduce Gary. Um, 
Well, I'd like to introduce uh, my <clears throat> friend, Gary Lingus. He and I met probably like four or five years ago uh, in Portland, uh, Maine. Oregon? <clears throat> No, Portland, Maine, actually. Um, I was spearheading a underground Narcan to get Narcan up to, their, up to them because <clears throat> at the time, their governor was a horror show and despised and had no passion, understanding, whatever you want to say, um, for people that suffered from uh, addiction. It ended up actually getting like shut down. Uh, DPH or whoever controls... Uh, the people that I was going to be getting uh, the Narcan from, uh, all of a sudden wanted a, a count. They wanted to know what the count was on how many cases of Narcan people had and where it was and all that. Uh, in, in inventory, I guess is the word. So anyway, long story short, um, I somehow got connected to, to Gary up there through people in Portland. And we bump into each other at events and his experience his street experience, his knowledge is um, that of something that you, that I long for personally and the people that surround us, you know, Gary brings a lot to the table and uh, I'm very interested to hear what you're doing now with BMC uh, in that job. So with further, no further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Gary uh, and take it away, Gary. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I'll start out with what I do now. What I do now is I'm a harm reduction specialist on the healing community study. It's a uh, three-year study, possibly four, in four states. The states are Kentucky, Ohio, New York, and Massachusetts. The goal of the study is to reduce fatal overdoses by 40% uh, through working with um, high... Um, overdose incidents, communities, plus rural communities and um, urban communities. So we're working um, in Massachusetts right now. We're working with eight communities. I don't know if I can name them all, but I'll try. Sandwich and Bourne, Plymouth, Brockton, Lowell, Salem, Shirley Townsend, um, God, they'll come back to me soon. You know, but it's like, I don't know what meet I'm in. I don't know what city, because now it's all on Zoom, so I'm in like these different communities every day. So it's working through uh, creating a coalition in the community and um, identifying some of the best practices and promising practices that they're doing to um, reduce overdoses in their community and then just try to expand on it a little bit. But it's all community, it's coalition led. Um, it's not, we're gonna start a new, we're not coming in and starting a new program. Um, we're throwing a lot, there's a lot of money that the, it, it's, it's funded by the National Institute of Health um, for $400 million. And um, uh, yeah, it's just to really engage and reach that target population that is at highest risk for overdose. So these are people, persons who use drugs, people being released from prison, jails, um, people that may uh, be in recovery and then they start using again. Um, so it's really to reach that group. All right. And um there's a lot of things going on in a lot of these communities. There, there's family groups and there's recovery groups and there's, you know what, but the, it's that population of persons who use drugs that are really, um, you know, everybody wants them to stop using drugs. You know, like, like it's not going to happen today. I just, just, just to let, let you know, it's not today is not going to be the day that everybody says, I'm going to choose the yellow brick road of recovery. Okay. Um, <laughs> And I've learned this the hard way. You know, I've researched opioids for 53 years now. Um, I grew up in a time where, like, you know, that was an option for me. And, and I ended up uh, in New York City a lot of times. And, and um, you know, I'm the population. I'm the population that we're talking about. Like, you know, I, I lived for 27 years, like, just living like that, trying to survive, raising a family. 
you know, getting a job, starting a business, but I continue to use drugs. And uh, you know what? Like, um, for one reason or another, like, you know, like it finally, you know, it got to me where I had to like slow down. I had to stop for a while sometimes. And, um, but, you know, when HIV hit the scene, it was like a whole different story. It was something like today, except, um, it was something like today with the opiate, uh, the opiate overdose crisis. Um, but then with the COVID, uh, situation now, it's like, it's, it's like a double whammy, you know, for all of us. And, uh, and the community, that, you know, we're all being impacted. It is 75,000 people dead across the country in like two and a half, three months. It's like, you know, we don't know the numbers aren't in yet. I don't know what's, you know, what the final numbers are going to be. And it sucks that we have to talk about them as in numbers, you know, but like, that's, that's the reality of, of where we're at. And, um, and so a lot of the population that is really at risk, we find and oh, like, of course, people in nursing homes, homeless populations, veterans, veterans, um, administration buildings and, and, you know, uh, hospitals. Um, and so my, uh, main population of pe- uh, people that are living in uh, outside, People that are living outside, they're not engaged. They're not engaged where they're not engaged to healthcare. They're not engaged to any of the social services. They're not engaged with, um, they're just not, it's not an engaged population. So what we do in harm reduction is we try to provide um, some immediate needs to keep that person alive. So you know what? If they make a choice to continue to use, they make a choice. It's their choice. It's not mine. It's not mine. I can't like, I can't own that. If they make a choose, if they choose recovery and treatment and all, that's their choice. That's wonderful. I applaud you, you know, but I'm not going to like, you know, like leave the other guy out and say, you know, like, all right, like, you know, like this guy is dirty. This guy's clean. I don't, I don't, I don't mess around with that stuff, you know? I don't try, I try not to label folks. Um, I try not to label them as, as addicts. They're persons who use drugs. There's so many people that use drugs, right, that we don't even talk about. The hardest folks to reach who are using opioids now are, um, are people living like, you know, normal lives, people living in their homes, people that are strung out. They're hard to reach because you know what? They go to work all day, they come home, they do their drugs at home. We don't, they don't, they don't come out and, and, you, you know, seek services at like a syringe exchange program at, or at an OEND program where they can get knocked in. They don't do that stuff. So like we have to think of creative ways to reach that population. Uh, one of the best ways I've found over the last several years um, has been like the post overdose um, strategies that some communities have put in place where we visit homes, you know, and, and I started this with, um, I believe it was a Revere fire department years ago, years ago, years ago, like seven, eight years ago. And, um, it gave us an opportunity to go to folks homes and it wasn't like, you know, Hey, listen, we're here to get you into treatment. We have to, you know, change and like, you know, give you this option of treatment. Guess what? Most of them understand they have that option, but when you're tied up in, in shooting heroin and hustling for dope, or working for drugs all day, you know what? You just don't have, you're, you're not there. They're not there yet. They're, they're just not there. And they may never be there. So what do you do? To, what do you do to, for the health of that individual, their family, and our community? You know, because the, the healthier we can keep a person who uses drugs, the healthier their family is and the healthier the community is. It may not be ideal. Like family members are going to be upset about a lot of this stuff. They're going to be upset that their, their family members are still using drugs. You know, but then if you focus on, hey, listen, they have a job, like if they can, you know, get maybe some medical care, they start caring about themselves in in that way um, and they make a change. You know what? I've seen that change continue on and on and on. It's like the story we were talking about before. You know, the guy behind the dumpster with maggots in his feet, Christmas shopping at a mall with his 14-year-old son and he hadn't used for 14 years. You know, like that was his decision. That was his decision. You know, like I, I worked with this gentleman for, for a long time. And um, I, that my goal wasn't to get him any place. It wasn't to get him in recovery. It wasn't to get him like all the dope he wanted. 
it was to keep him alive. And then he changed. Do you know, like, that's how it worked. That's how it worked for me. It wasn't like all the prayers that my mother did for 27 years. You know, like, was it that? I don't know. You know, like, that's the way, you know, she dealt with it. Um, it was like a cell. It was a thing that, like, I had seen a lot of my friends dying. And, and I just didn't want I wanted to be part of a solution rather than the problem. And that's when I started taking up syringe access and syringe exchange in, in the 80s, you know, and knock in in the 90s. You know, like that's was an immediate public health response that that showed results right away, the knock in, right away. I mean, when we first started distributing knock in in mass, it was 1999, you know, before the state even, they didn't have an idea, they didn't have a clue about what was what was going on, like, you know, like, and in, in, as we were bringing knock in into the state and, and practicing medicine without a license, you know, like, that's what I am. Like, I, you know, I, I'm a doctor without a license. That's, you know, the way I consider it. I do low threshold health care. And uh, should I be arrested for it? I don't know. Some people say yes. Yeah, some people say no. But like, you know, <laughs> um, you know, I've been arrested a couple of times for doing the, the work that I do. And, and, and that's, you know, that's fine and, and well with me, you know, like, you know, cause I know, it grows. This is like a movement that grows and grows and grows to love people where they're at, to love them. Like, you know what? To love them. Not like, Jesus, look at you. I got to fix. I got to save you. I got to save you. You know, I yeah. could walk down any street, not just San Francisco, streets of Boston, Detroit, New York, Colorado, like Ohio, every state and then it's a different it, it's it, it's it might be a different um, culture but it goes on all down south also you know it's all around our country there's people that like for one yeah. reason or another they chose this 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 path to take and uh you know what some of them might be stuck on it and some of them might say it's fine with me man i'm working i have a job i could do this i can do that you know um but me i keep it basic all right Let's keep you alive. Just one more day. Just one more day. Let's just, 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 just one more day. Like, you know what? Use a clean syringe. Here's some knock in. Here's a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, please. Like anything, their immediate needs. And that gets to, like to the, the San Francisco story, the immediate needs. Like you take a bunch of homeless folks that have been living like, you know, in their own little community, like, you know, 15th and 16th street and, you know, like, all along and you put them in a hotel, I think it's really going to change. Are they going to say, well, this is Shangri-La and I'm staying here. Like, you know what? I'm going to quit doing drugs. No, it's not like right. that. You no. Know? And we have our own hotels in Massachusetts. Okay. You no, know, like we're working with five hotels right now that we've home that we've housed hundreds of homeless folks who are uh, COVID positive. Uh, many that were like living in the doorways. There's some still communities where we know, like, you know, like I don't want to mention the cities, but they're living in, in, in like in rain soaked sleeping bags in somebody's doorway, you know, like in town. And um, so I think the humane thing to do, especially with a crisis like a COVID going on, is to like isolate the folks that are like sick, give them a place where they can really um quarantine try to get healthy we have nurses in the hotel 24 hours a day right. we have security guards in in the hotel uh 24 hours a day uh, we provide um, medically assisted treatment um if they want to go and or order alcohol they can go order alcohol like you were saying the tobacco thing it's a big thing a lot of them don't have money they smoke right. cigarettes like I've tried to smoke. I mean, I, I've quit smoking cigarettes for 15 years, yeah. and, you know, five years, and I light up another butt. You know, that's just the way it is for me. I'm sorry. You know, like it doesn't make my family happy, but um, that's just the way it is. You know what? We, they have a policy around cigarettes, you know, and it's um, they get some donations and get them cigarettes and then they hand out cigarettes. So like, you know what? It's it's like give, and meeting their immediate needs. But while they're doing while we're doing that, we have hundreds of homeless folks that that are being cared for, 
being observed. Um, if they do want to use drugs, that we ask that they um, like reach out to the nurse so the nurse can observe. Um, we have other options we're working on now where there's call-in numbers for the general public that we're trying to work on where they can call in if they're using. Um, it's called Never Use Alone. Uh, I don't know if it's based out of Tennessee or Michigan, but we had a long conversation with the founder the other day, uh, myself and Alexander Wally, who was a doctor in Massachusetts that uh, signs all the standing orders for a lot of the pharmacies and he oversees the state's OEND program. So we had a conversation to try to bring that into Massachusetts and, and we're working on that now. So there's a lot of things, you know, that, we, that we're doing uh, during these times that, um, yeah, they may be like, you know, like that. Wow, that's way out there. That's way out there. Right. I was going to ask you about the San yeah. Francisco thing. I mean, what's your take on that? Because I wasn't really sure how, how you felt about that story. Well, honestly, we've, I've had the same thought for a while, you know, and, and I've asked. I said, why can't we um, why can't we prescribe hydromorphin? Why can't we give them Dilaudid? You know, and I understand why, because of the Harrison Act, because of laws from 1915. That's why we can't do it. So we do the next best thing. You get your own dope, fine, do it. But, like, let us know. We'll give you the supplies. Supplies are delivered to the hotel. Um, safe injection equipment, Narcan. Every room is, like, supply whatever they want. It's like a menu of stuff they get. Uh, and uh, that's just the way it is. But it's, you know what? We're keeping folks alive. And out of those hundreds, some of them are going to like, you know, go back and say, you know what? I, I just, I just want to get in my tent. I just want to be in my tent. Right. Others are going to say, geez, you know, I've been staying in this hotel for two weeks. I've taken a shower every day. Right. I've, I've eaten food. I've had care. They've, they've like addressed like, you know, my problems with my abscesses. They've, They've, you know, like they're, they're taking care of me physically. I like this. I think I, I think I might, you know, take another step. I might go another direction. I don't know. It's not my decision to make. It's an individual decision that comes down to every one of us. You know, like nobody, nobody forced me to go anyplace. Nobody forced me to change. Nobody forced me to change my opinion around, because I had different opinions when I first stopped using drugs around methadone, syringe exchange, you know what I'm saying? Well, geez, you know, like... It, all of a sudden, it, it became like not all right. It was all right when I was using, but wait a minute. Now I'm not using, you know. And this is, you know, like the the end of the '80s and the in the '90s. I'm saying, well, geez, you know, like I had to really, really dig deep to look at myself and say, you know what? It took you 27 years, buddy. You know, like you you didn't get it overnight. You're not a rocket science. You're not anything special. Um, no different than anybody else. I understand the struggles we go through. I understand how drugs work. I understand that, like when I was a kid suffering from a te attention deficit disorder, they didn't give me medication. I did my own. I did my own. Self medicated. That's right. You so know what? Gary, you think, you think you're part of the. the old and I survived. Right. right. So are you part of the, the, the larger population or are you kind would you consider yourself an anomaly? And, and, and then the second question would be, how successful and do you have any stats on the love versus you know treating them with setting them up in the hotels and giving them everything they need and doing that whole how how successful has it been comparatively all right right now it's really early in the game but as far as giving the love and like when i say love it's like you know what i have a syringe for you i care about you i love you and i don't want to see you die all right do you want to see the data on that Oh, uh, HIV was reduced by 80% in Massachusetts among uh, injection drug users when we made uh, syringe access available. 80% of HIV infections. So I guess that's a number. You know, if we want to play numbers, right? Yeah. We have a hotel that's been like, you know, running for probably about three weeks now. Um, have I heard any nightmare stories? Of course, I've heard the stories of like, you know, like somebody in a cocaine induce like you know like uh, all night long like you know walking through the hallways and shit like that but i've also seen the person that like really has, has taken care of themselves start taking care of themselves like hy hygienically like like shaving like i don't do that anymore and um, <laughs> um yeah i see i see yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Andy's in that club. <laughs> yeah. This is love it. And um, yeah, it's like, you know, um, so I, I guess, you know, like hopefully we'll get some numbers and hopefully, you know, when I, when I talk to my, my uh, colleagues at uh, BMC, you know, this is a time we have to push the envelope a little, little to keep people alive. We really, really do. Because you know what? The, the, that, that crisis we all forgot about, the overdose crisis, it's still happening. It's spiking in some places. Like More so, yeah. Spiking. It's going to get worse still, right? It's going to get worse. Get worse. You know, 36, like, 36 overdoses in one week with 11 fatals in Plymouth County. Yeah, the problem is. County. That's right. There are 11, so, 11 fatals, yeah. So, Gary, let me ask you something. Yep. Rumor has it that because the uh, trade from China has been, you know, stopped, fentanyl, uh, fentanyl is coming back. I mean, uh, heroin is coming back, like at a vengeance. Um, have you heard anything like that? You know what? We haven't uh, we haven't heard of a drug shortage. Be it fentanyl or heroin, we haven't heard of a drug shortage. Um, they haven't closed I, those businesses yet, right? <laughs> it, right, it's it, business goes on, you know, and drug dealers and, are still in business. <laughs> yeah, and the, and the fentanyl, you know, I'm, I'm, I imagine there's still some, you know, still some coming across that that we we're dealing with because there's been fa fatal fentanyl overdoses. So, right. um, so there's no shortage really. In some spots, it might be, you know, it might be more difficult to procure your drugs. You know, there's no like the hustle is gone, like. You know, if you if you support your habit by going into stores and boosting, sorry, that's all over. You know what I mean? Like 20 people at a time in a store and all eyes are on you. You know what I mean? You know, women that that, are, that have to resort to work and like out in the street, you know, they, they stick, you know, everybody's sticking out like sore thumbs. You know, it's not like, you know, the bustle in city where you could just blend in now. It's a lot different for that whole population. So uh, there's a lot of eyes on everybody. And um and it, it is like difficult to do the work, but there are people still out there doing the work on the street that I admire. I love them to death. I talk to them on a daily basis. It breaks my heart. I have to like, I have to leave some of the meetings I'm at to go in my room and just like shed some tears because like, I can't like, I'm not able to be out there and it's not about me. You know, like there's so many great people doing the work, you know, like, um, of, of, you know, delivering supplies to homeless encampments, get, helping people in homeless, homeless encampments get tested for COVID, helping them access uh, uh, like a hotel in a community because it's not just Massachusetts is doing like these five hotels. Communities have stepped up. There's several communities in this state that have stepped up, reached out to hotels, have made deals with them, and they're paying for people to stay in the hotels. It's it's like, you know, but they're not as regulated as us. Like I said. Is that because it's fu private funding, Gary? It's not. It's private? like it's some of it's city funding, some of it's veterans funding. You know, like I I, 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 I disclosed earlier on a, on a, the pre-show that I have a family member, a brother that's homeless. He's 70. He's going to be 70 years old. Wow in two days two days he's homeless you know and he's been living in his van and um you know the city where he lives somebody helped him connect you know of course you know like um you know they told me when people found out who it was they called me up and stuff they said we're trying i said well thank you very much because like you know what i'd put him up in a hotel sometimes my brother would put him up in a hotel sometimes we'd deliver food to him sometimes but that's a family taking care of family members and that's the way it should be like i'm not going to judge my brother you know he's my brother and i'm going to take care of him until the end till the end you know what i mean and we don't see eye to eye we don't see eye to eye my, me and my brother but i love him you know, he does things that I don't agree with, but I love him, you know, and uh, that's just the way it is. That's the biggest thing that I've learned in harm reduction, you know, how to love people just it, that they might, not, they might not think too kindly of me, but it's not about them thinking about me. It's about me thinking of them. You Harry, uh, so I had a question. Sorry to cut you off. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, okay. My question is, how is the other side of the the people who um because it's a controversial subject on some levels 
how are other people responding to this? What what is the um, the opposing view on this on harm reduction? Um, well, if you've known me over the last thirty years, like you know what, I could give a good shit about the opposing view. Right. If I if I think something's right, I think you know. I'm, of course, I hear it and I get it back on Facebook constantly. You know what I mean? I mean, of course, I get into the 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 beefs, like uh, I'll call them, right? But um, the opposing view is, of course, enabling. Uh, you know, you're supporting their drug use. You're support. No, I'm not. They're gonna. They believe me. People are gonna use drugs without my support. Nobody that I've ever worked with asked me permission to shoot dope. Nobody. They've done it on their own. It's not like I said, yeah, you know, like, go shoot dope. And they go, you know what? That's what they do. So, like, the opposing view, fine. Work on whatever whatever strategies you want to work on to make the world better. I'm in my little, I'm in my little lane. That's what I'm staying in. You know, I've been on the highway and, and taken detours, and I know where it gets my life. I don't want to go down that detour anymore. You know, but other folks are out there that um, they're on their own highway. I'm sorry. They have their own views. That's fine. That's fine. I don't want to talk to a rock. You know, like if somebody comes up with a completely opposed, and it always brings it back, because mostly it goes back to the past. Yeah, but so-and-so did this. And so what are we doing now? It's about now. about keeping somebody alive now, not yesterday. And not tomorrow. It's about now, right today. How can we make our, our society, how can we make our communities, how can we make our families and individuals healthier? How can we do that? So I don't so, have all the answers. So, Gary. Yes, uh, tell, I do not. I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. lay away from trying to make the answers up. Um, Gary, tell me about the um, safe injection sites and where Massachusetts slash Boston stands. Because I know that pre-COVID, you know, uh, I had attended a thing in Boston at the state house and signed some papers and got my local people to sign some papers. And it was supposed to be going to a vote, but I think COVID got in the way. Um, did you get any, do you have any kind of um, insight as to, I know there was a lot of pushback uh, was. on that? Yeah. You know, I was fortunate enough to serve on the governor's commission last year on his harm reduction commission examining supervised injection facilities throughout the world and different parts of the country, you know, different parts of like, you know, Canada and Europe and stuff like that. Um, and, and like you said, COVID just hit and like, you know, everything just stopped. So I really don't know where it's at right now. All I know is like, you know, in a little way, what we have with like this, um, uh, never use alone phone call. That's supervised injection facility over the phone. Do you know what I mean? That's like it's being over the phone. A person's using their drugs. We want to make sure they're all right. We'll hook them up with. We'll you know we we can connect to nine one one right away to get you know get to their address. So in a way, um, it happens in different ways. And there, there are like, it's not just like, you know, a brick and mortar site that like, this is where you go for supervised injection facilities. You know, there, there's many, many ways, you know, mobile units over the phone, like people, like when, when we come into an area where there's a lot of high density drug use, you know, um, and I'm not going to pick out the streets of that in Boston, but like, you know, you see it happening, people shooting dope. I mean, I've seen it all the, you know, with people just sitting on the sidewalk shooting dope. I was, know? I was blown away. Uh, not that long ago. Um, I used to walk up and down methadone mile, just oh, whether, yes, whether, yeah, I was, too. Me too. whether I was looking for somebody or just trying Work. to take it all in and talk to people and kind of get a feel and understanding. So this past summer I was on methadone mile and I was in front of paths and there's officers outside of paths for obvious reasons. There were drug deals going on in front of the officer, and there were people sitting on the street just in front of Pats using. And I was... Chris, what's Pats for people who don't know? Uh, I don't Methadone know clinic, for. right? No, no. Pats is it's, it's, a re, it's a center where people who want services, who want to get into treatment, they can go. And okay. uh, like it used to be the old room, um, what they call it, BMC, like room five or something like that, where you go and, and that help you get into treatment. 
Okay. That's what like Pat's is. And okay. on that Albany Street, because I hate to call it methanol mild, the stigma. Recovery and, Road. Yeah, you're right. You're right. The recovery I Road. It has a name. It's Albany Street. That's all. Right. That's Albany all. Street. Right. I couldn't but remember. They have Pat's where people can get it, you know, right. seek recovery. They, they have a place. They have a syringe access program, an overdose prevention program. They have outreach workers that go around. And that's just like, you, you, you're looking at that, those folks out there on the street. You know what? If you dig a little deeper, go down some of the alleys, go down some of the like the little like places where like, you know, a safe place is behind a few dumpsters and you'll see crowds of people. You know, you're just seeing the tip of it. Oh, absolutely. And, and, absolutely. And exactly. It breaks like, my, my heart. Office, my office was over there on at BMC. I used to work over uh, for BMC. Yeah. for a, uh, a short time and we were on uh, a mass ave and so um i remember the cumberland farms man like you walk into the cumberland farms and it, they actually shut down but if you walked in there it was like a congregation of people in there um and you know i think that's why they closed but i mean i remember asking for a paper towel like i couldn't get a paper towel i had to ask the security guard who hold a, hold a roll of paper towels it's a really interesting it's a very interesting street you really see a lot and i know for me i went from working on com ave at bu to bmc and that was like oh my oh. god it was such culture <laughs> culture shock it was really unique so um so i'm hearing what you guys are saying and that's my I actually uh, i actually went to um one of the places on Ma on right there on mass well mass ave um it was eye-opening to say the least it oh was, yeah. Um, yeah yeah and now now i was down there and and there was a woman she was shooting dope on the, just sitting on the sidewalk with her legs crossed shooting dope you know and i, I would have loved to have been able to say you know you can go inside and they have a nice like sterilized injection site where you can sit down and they'll they'll observe they'll watch you afterwards you, you, you know you have you're less uh, likely to have a fatal overdose but I couldn't, so I just stood in front of her. So no, you know, people were talking, oh, talking at her. Um, I have visited some of the sites that we have in this country, the underground sites, and um, it's just amazing just to watch what happens and like, and the interaction between staff and participants of uh, that come in. You know, it's there's so much that ha it's not just like I'm going to watch you shoot dope. It's the conversations that happen. Right. It's a like, you know, like, geez, where, you know, who are you? Who are you? Where, like, you know, like, tell me about your life. Like, you, oh, you do have a, and you have a family. And, like, somebody loves you. And, like, you know, I mean, it's not like we're, we're dealing with, like, a bunch of Martians that came down and were planted on, on, on. Right, there's on, a story on, there, right? Union Street. You know, they're people. They're people. That's bottom line. It's, it's, they, they had a dog. Were you at that thing in Boston? I don't know if you were at that where they had they brought the doctor from um, Canada because they were we were looking at the study that was done in Canada and they talked about I don't know the numbers but they talked about the reduction and what struck me and what my always my understanding was of a safe injection site was how would it look like if you go to a place right you walk in that first time and the first time they greet you they get to know your name they make sure that you're safe and you walk out and you're like, okay, that was like weird. That was, you know, but then the next time you go back and it's like, Hey Gary, how are you today? You know, come on in. And, and then you start to grow, you start to grow that relationship. And the goal of the safe injection sites are to keep you safe. Um, you know, help you prevent you from catching any further diseases or preventing you from getting any diseases. And then like the end game is, is maybe to provide some hope and encourage you to take that next step to not, you know, use to get help. Um, I think that, you know, if you think about it, like when you go to a Dunkin Donuts, it's not really the same thing, but if you go to a Dunkin Donuts and you go to the same Dunkin Donuts every single day and you start to create that relationship with the, the person that's either on the, the headphones and they're like, Hey Gary, uh, regular. Yep. Okay. And you come up, you feel good. It makes you feel good inside to know that somebody has taken the time to get to know you. And I think that a safe injection site is 
the goal of that is to provide hope again, you know, and to build that relationship because a lot of these people are so disconnected to the world that they don't feel worthy. So I know that my job is my first goal is to restore hope, keep them safe and restore hope. So, I mean, you know, it's the same with the homeless people. I mean, I was doing that, um, that outreach for a long time, years back. And I was blown away by saying, Hey, we can get you into a shelter tonight. Would you like to go? And they wouldn't want to go because the shelters are more scary than being out in the streets. Yeah. And I, I don't, I don't understand that. I don't, I don't, I can't wrap my head around. It's snowing. It's three below and you're okay with cardboard boxes, sleeping bags, um, a thin, uh, blanket that we would give you an insulating blanket that we would give you some hot cocoa or coffee, you know, we could take you out of this situation, but they don't want to go. I can't imagine life being so incredibly horrible to have at least a little better in my eyes option. So I think what you're doing, Gary, is, you know, you're restoring hope. You're keeping people alive. We have some sure the key word. You say connect. And that's what this is all about. Connection. You know what? Stopping at the hot chocolate. You gave somebody hot chocolate. That's an it's engagement. Kind. It's yeah. kind. Andy, did you say we had some? Yeah, we had some. Uh, we had some good feedback um, on uh, on on the chat line. I guess if you will. Um, somebody yeah. said, I don't want to say names, but um, remember, people who use drugs' goal is not always to be in recovery. Many many of us just don't want to die is one um and then another one says because it's also homeless people i don't say method a mile it got me clean um i show it to anyone using it's about keeping people alive today so um so yeah so we're getting some good feedback out there which is great and please continue reading your uh writing into us because um it's very helpful um i think to people out there and uh no death threats? Not yet. <laughs> no. Not, They're in my PM box. <laughs> not, not, yeah, not those, are, those are sent privately. <laughs> but it's a. T- I mean, this is a, this is a really tough subject, and I know that a lot. Of, there's a lot of differing opinions on, on this. Is. But um, how? I guess I've asked this question before because I'm really fascinated about it. I've asked Chris this. Um, we asked Shannon DeMille, who came on from Clean Slate Centers, um, and I guess I want to ask you. How do you how do you cope with all this? You know, working in this field and working with people. What what do you do to preserve yourself mentally? Um, I see a therapist. I still have a therapist. I'm in my seventies. I'm never going to be well. I'm never going to be perfect. So I I do. I still seek out therapy for myself. I have a I have a network of um, folks, both at work and outside of work, um, that are really supportive of the work that I've done. I work with one of the best teams I've ever worked with in my life, as far as diversity, knowledge, being bright and being young at BMC. Like this study has, like you know, I was ready to quit work, you know, and then you know things happen. I was on the I was working on the grant that, that for this thing. And then I was an advisor. And then I, you know, like they said, this, this is a position like this, you know, they, right. it like, so it's with yeah. Colleen. Do you know Colleen? I work with no? Colleen. Oh, she's the I've best. I've known Colleen for 30 years. Love Colleen. She's awesome. Yeah. She's part of the study. Okay. She's our, our, MO, she's our MOUD uh, and, and, and like replacement, you know, like the, the, the uh, suboxone person, because that's a big part of our study. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, OEND, prevent overdose, um, link folks up with um, medically assisted treatment, and then work on the other bucket is working on, on, on safer prescribing. So um, that's how I got started in this whole thing. Oh, with Colleen? Yeah, working with Colleen, I started putting together an idea and I started kicking tires. And it's really an interesting story that I can share. I, um, I, this, it really inspired me. I was a sports sponsorship guy. I knew nothing about this, right? So I go to BMC 
And when I'm at BMC, I started working on a program that I, my idea was called Remove the Mask because I started learning about opioid addiction. So I wanted to reach, and I was learning about all these young hockey players that were overdosing. So I created a program to try to use media, education, and outreach to try to help young hockey players. So I kicked the tires with Colleen trying to put this whole thing together. And um, it kind of went out of my scope of my job at BMC. So things changed for, for me because yeah. they're like, oh, well, that's not really where you're supposed to be. But I thought it was. So um, so then I went off and did this stuff on my own. And this is kind of how it came to be. But um, Colleen was somebody I was working with trying to put this whole concept together. So Colleen's a good her. Boston woman. She's great. She's great. You know? I, I met her in the early HIV days when she was in a little closet of an office up BMC, and, and we used to do a lot of work together, a lot of work together with a, with a population of uh, HIV uh, positive uh, homeless folks. And, you know, I've known her ever since, and, and she's just a joy to have on the study. I mean, I had Dr. Eddie Bernstein, you must know him from, you might know him from. No relation, but. Project uh-huh. Assert in BMC. I, I love Project uh, Tootie. Okay. He founded, um, you know, Project Assert. He's like the grandfather of motivational interviewing, like expert. No, of not motivational, expert. You know, he developed a lot of expert programs around. Gary, oh, what's expert for, pe- so for people who don't? It's know. like, um, oh God, I, let me see. It's a brief intervention of uh, where, um, doing an assessment of somebody and, and like, you, you know, like it's, it's, it's working like in, in a motive with motivational interviewing harm reduction to, to engage the population that, you know, that, that, that are, that are not on the fence that are on the fence, you know, like they can go wherever they like to go. Uh, it's been located at uh, BMC and it's been ongoing, I believe since 1993 or 94. Oh yeah. It's successful. It's definitely a, a, a- oh modality that is uh that is used quite a bit there's models all over the country of it now so yes you know like look up eddie bernstein it's just like he's he's a he's a character he's like he's he, he i can't tell you his age but he's older than me and like he's just a he's just a wonderful beautiful guy we so should have him on our show yeah well look his name is bernstein he's got to be good right that's right like, no there's... of no relation but i'll take it i mean that's cool <laughs> is that your uncle no, but he could be. I mean, we might. Who from, is his uncle from his other mother? Hey, um, <laughs> where can people reach out to you if they want to connect with you? Is there a place that, um, you know, they can connect? Um, well, I'm at Boston Medical Center. My office is in Charlestown, but it's been like here on this couch for probably about uh, three months. And, um, you know, I, I like Andy, I don't do as much frontline work. I'm not running up to shooting galleries anymore, like doing abscess care and all that right. stuff. So I work mainly like within the study and then all the state funded programs. I have so many connections with all of those folks. Interesting. I love them dearly. And they're all part, they're all part of this, you know, like they have to be part of this study, you know, like, cause we're working on OED overdose prevention. So, and again, it's not like we're coming in to create a new program. We're not. We mm-hmm. just want to like, you know, like fine tune things maybe or, or like uh, make suggestions if they're looking for them, offer support, financial support, because I told you it's $400 million. We don't keep the money. It goes to the communities. Mm. And um, so, and it's not just 400 in, in mass. It's 400 throughout the whole study. That's four states. Um, but it's. So um, is, it, is any of it going to get dumped into treatment, like making our treatment facilities a little bit better or is this all uh, is this all harm reduction if that, if that happens on the way with the strategies that the community the coalition is working on yes yeah. of course of course if somebody says geez i want to go to treatment guess what the, the you know the wheels start spinning and you get them in treatment if they say well like I, I, i'm willing to try like you know suboxone or methadone all right fine we have nurses that we've hired that we can hire in all of these cities also that were given to the city you know, the, the, the city has the power, the community has the power uh, to hire a nurse, a coordinator, you know, like, th- so there's, there, there's a lot of resources. And like I was talking to one group the other day, I said, right now, 
you are in a cocoon of some place where there's no other, you know, there's eight communities in Massachusetts, like at this phase one stage with like some extra resources. So use them, use us like anything we can do right now, because we're only here for a short time. What's the name of the program? What's the name? I'm sorry. We call it mass heal. It's like mass M A a uh, capital H E A L mass heal or healing community study. If you put in community study, you'll probably get, you know, like the, everything from the state. But uh, again, I can be reached at BMC. I'm easy to find like, you know, like there's a outstanding warrants on me at all times. An APB, (laughs) an APB. (laughs) (laughs) But I can, Um, you know, it's my name, Gary Langis at BMC.org. Somebody called you a rock star. One of the chat, they said Gary is a rock star. No, they're rock stars, probably. Oh, they could be. Everybody's a rock star. Um, will, you come back, will you come back on again? Do we scare you away? Will you- <laughs> Stuck here. Like, I'm in, talking about the communities being in a cocoon. I'm in a cocoon here. Like they, We all are. <laughs> you know, they tell me at work, you know, like I have Dr. Wally and my director tell me, Gary, don't go out of your house. Don't go out of your house. <laughs> I go out like 15 minutes a day unless I'm sitting out in my deck. Like in the courtyard in prison. Like you go out, you do a little. Uh, yeah, yeah. 23 hours a day right here. Bro. Yeah. I don't know that personally. I've seen it on TV. I've heard too. Yeah. I've seen it on TV. I think that's our show for the week. Is That, that is our show for, for today. Yeah. And the week. So Gary, thank you so much. We love what you do. Thank you for all the selfless work and, and, and everything you've done for 30 years. It's been, you've been amazing. Thank you. you. Know, thank you. Thank you for bringing this stuff up. And, and Chris, thanks. You know, cause it is about connecting, you know, when we do connect, you know, it's all about human connection, but it's also about connecting people to their next step. That's why I like, I like to have that resource list in my head, the menu in my head that when somebody says, Listen, I want to go to this particular, I want to go to a woman's sober house. Where, where can I go? <laughs> well, you know, there's a place called, you know, Brady's Landing down here. You know, like I have the connection, you know. That's what it's all about, right? right. Resources. It's all about connection. Networking. Right. That's why we did this. Part of the reason we did this, you know, yeah. to get the resources Absolutely. out there, education, all that good stuff. Call SAMHSA so, if anybody yeah. needs. Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, harm reduction is only in a continuum. You know, like we're right. working with people who are in pre-contemplative right. stages. When they get to that contemplative stages, guess what? We work with them. All right, that's where you're at. Let's go. All right. Then when stages they, of change, right? Action step. <laughs> wow, that's cool. You want to do that? You know, it's a motivational interviewing. It's that continuum of care. And, um, and that hope. And for some reason, I was picked to work with the pre-contemplated folks <laughs> and I love them to death. I love them. I love them. I love them. I love them. And I love people to serve them and take care of them and feed them and give them tents and, and, and not walk away because a guy pissed his pants, you know, like really, these are human beings. Yeah. They're human beings. Yeah. Somebody's father, son, daughter. Sure. It's, it could be I'm my t- brother. You know what I mean? I'm- Right. Have tolerance, have patience, have, have kindness, compassion. have love. Compassion. compassion. Yeah. So that'll do us. That'll do us, guys. Um, we got to sign off. Um, we also want to thank, uh, say happy Mother's Day to all the happy mothers, mother's including Day. Our, Day. our very young Chris. <laughs> Kristen Perry Long. Hey, uh, before we, we sign off, SAMHSA, Substance Abuse Mental Health Administration. Right. If you need any information or any resources, um, it's a clearing house. They have a lot of good stuff on there. It's samsha.gov. Yeah, I've been there. <laughs> Great website. <laughs> right? <laughs> Many times. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. Right. Thanks. Well, all, right. all right. Join us thank next Wednesday at 11. This have is the a map. great weekend. Thank you. Bye, Thanks. everybody. You've been watching the map. Yeah. Bye. Michael. Bye. Bye there. Bye-bye.